All right. Good afternoon, everyone. Or I guess it is still morning. Hi, everyone. Everyone's enjoying their conversations. <laughs> You're herding cats. Now. I'm herding cats. Is that the way it's working? All right. If I can get you to uh, silence your conversations and pick them up again after this discussion, I can try to keep the discussion short if that's what you want. Um, so the Dan was. Uh, Dan twisted my arm pretty hard to have me speak about what I think agriculture will look like in the future. And uh, I, I said, well, that's, I, I, my response was I'm, I've never, I don't usually talk about that topic and uh, I'm not sure exactly what I, have, what I will have to say. So I, uh, it'll be interesting to see how this conversation, how this discussion goes. What I'm, what I'm, I've been very intrigued by in, in some of the work that I do outside of agriculture, uh, I'm also a partner in an investment fund where we look at a lot of early stage technologies that are connected to th three major areas, um, agricultural biotech and, and um, ag tech development. Uh, we're also looking at medical biotech and we're also looking at blockchain technologies. And there's a combination, of, there's some really interesting things that are happening at the combination of the in at those intersections. And so looking at all these various pieces has led me to really look at what will, what is the potential of the future of agriculture really look like? And for the purpose of this conversation and this discussion, I'm going to focus specifically on North America and the U.S. here where we are, because I believe that in the very near future, actually much sooner than 2050, perhaps as early as uh, 2035, 2040, agriculture is going to have almost no resemblance to what we know and understand today. The only similarity that will remain is that we'll have green plants growing in soil. Um, and in addition to that, just about everything else is going to be different. So um, to provide some context, I'd like to speak a little bit about first about what is the situation today? What, what is actually happening today? And uh, specifically in the context and the framework again of freedom of vegetable production. So in the United States, uh, USDA data, according to the uh, 2015 census, there are a total, there's a total of 2.1 million farmers in the U.S. But the moment you begin scrutinizing what actually defines a farmer, uh, the, those people who derive the majority of their income from farming are actually less than half a million, about 450,000. That's general broad scale agriculture. When you begin looking at fruit and vegetable production specifically, there are um, 69,335 fruit and vegetable growers in the U.S. as of 2015. Of those, 6,927 produce, have greater than half a million in annual revenue and produce 90% of the total supply chain. 6,927, less than 7,000. So that means there are 7,000 growers that produce the majority of the supply chain and 90%. So, in our work at Advancing Eco-Agriculture, what I became very passionate about, what I'm very dedicated to is the realization that, you know, if we want to really, if we are committed to changing the quality of the food supply and changing the quality of the food that is on grocery store shelves, we need to work with those 7,000 growers. And that immediately then, of course, raises a dichotomy because there is also the very ideological perspective that the, that the future of agriculture uh, as as described by the FAO, is that the future of agriculture is with small-scale, regionalized, localized producers, um, people who are producing a few acres of fruits and vegetables, uh, or food crops, I should say, just in general, and doing that job really, really well. And there's some very strong evidence to support that. When you look at the global data, um, from, from a global perspective, large-scale agribusinesses produce 30% of the total global food supply chain and they use 70% of the total resources. Which means that the small scale producers produce 30% of the supply, excuse me, produce 70% of the supply chain with 30% of the resources. So there's um, tremendous arguments for efficiency for the small scale growers. So when we look at what is, what have been the factors and what has been the environment that allowed this current model of agriculture to really um, develop in the United States, um, these, the, the large scale growers, the 7,000 growers with greater than half a million in annual revenue uh, are obviously concentrated in specific regions of the country. We have the Great Lakes Fruit Belt region. Um, we have the Pacific Northwest, 
Columbia River Basin, Washington, we have California, we, and then we have the Southeast um, with Georgia, Washington, uh, excuse me, Georgia, Florida, and the Carolinas. And we have some regions in the central part of the country as well with uh, Arkansas being a unique, Arkansas and Mississippi being a unique outlier in producing a substantial amount of fruit and vegetable production. Georgia as well, well actually Georgia would be associated with Florida. So the great majority though of all those regions, the vast majority, like 70% of the total supply is produced in California. California production has evolved into its current state because of three unique and exceptional competitive advantages. The first major competitive advantage was climate. Growing fruit in a desert climate, relatively desert climate, very dry with a limited amount of disease and insect susceptibility, combined with that the second major competitive advantage was access to water. And the third major competitive advantage was access to affordable labor. Each of those three competitive advantages has disappeared in the last decade and is continuing to fade away at an ever faster rate. So when we look at climate, California has had a very strong climactic advantage. It still does to this day to some degree. However, today, because of <clears throat> heat stress, and other climactic factors that are occurring in California, increasingly high value crops such as berry crops, raspberries, blueberries, etc., are being planted inside high tunnels. They're being covered by high tunnels. And all of a sudden, the moment you cover a, a plant with a high tunnel, you can afford to put up a high tunnel in 80% of the country equally as effectively as you can with California. So the moment you move to climate protected agriculture, I specifically use the word climate protected, not indoor agriculture not greenhouse agriculture, but climate protected. Climate protection can mean different things. For some crops in some regions, it can mean protection with hail nets. Um, for others, it means high tunnels. But for whatever it means for a given crop, well, the moment you begin talking about a climate protected agriculture, California loses its climate advantage. You now have the similar climate advantages in other parts of the country. Secondly, access to water. We already know the problems that California has with water. I won't even... Um, continue, I won't go into detail in that conversation other than to say that um, as climatic con conditions continue and environmental conditions continue to develop, it is likely, very probable, extremely probable, that the eastern half of the United States where we have abundant rainfall is going to become extremely attractive to fruit and vegetable producers who are currently in California. Right now, today, large-scale California producers are pulling up stakes and moving their entire operations either north or south, north to the Columbia River Basin in Washington or south into Mexico. And uh, that is happening actually on a very large scale because they know that they don't have water resources, won't have water resources for the long term in California. The third major competitive advantage has been, for a long time, has been access to labor. And that advantage is also disappearing. I, in fact, I think I can say it has already disappeared. And the coming revolution in fruit harvesting and, and field management is going to shift to robotics. And it will happen much faster than you think. We now have robots that have the capacity to pick a ripe blackberry or a ripe black raspberry without bruising it. And when you can do that, you can do anything. You can harvest anything. So uh, we're already at the point where uh, fresh market picking and processing of fruit is going to be largely robotic, and I would predict that that will happen inside of the next 10 years. Majority of fruit will be harvested by robots, and a lot of uh, agricultural cultural management will also be done by robots rather than by people. So uh, when I say cultural management, I'm referring to pruning, trimming, trellising, etc. cetera. Um, so with robots, there is going to be a very rapid evolution and development curve. Uh, it won't, the, the cost of robots initially, the, the current robots that are on the market that are being deployed commercially uh, have a price tag depending on the crop that we're talking about anywhere in the neighborhood of a quarter million to $300,000. And I expect that to rapidly decline. Um, I'm not an expert on this part of the industry, but what I've observed and people I've spoken with, I anticipate that the cost of robots will decline to the point in about 15 to 20 years from now, they'll probably cost 50 to $75,000. And at that point, and these will be very multi-purpose, multi-use robots that can do a tremendous amount of work on a farm. And at this point, they now become accessible to smaller scale and mid-scale farms. 
So when we look at all these different, so these, this is some of what is, is already happening, not what, what is going to happen, but what is already happening. But then there are other forces outside of agriculture that I believe will completely and drastically change the business and consumer landscape in ways that uh, are probably difficult for us to, for any of us to imagine what it will exactly look like. The first, one of the first revolutions, uh, and I think it will be a revolution, will be the deployment of robotics in industry and transportation and energy. So if you want to dig a dip, bit, this is a topic that I think everyone needs to be thinking about and think about how it might impact their lives and be, become prepared for it. If you want to dig a bit deeper into this project, look at um, the Research Institute headed by Tony Seba, S-E-B-A. He is, you definitely want to look at his research, listen to some of his YouTube clips. Um, he heads a research think tank at Stanford University and with a focus on energy and transportation. So I'll just summarize a few of the very powerful <coughs> highlights that Tony has put together. Um, the first is that, um, and this is, by the way, this is not, this, this almost sounds unreal, but it is not hyperbole. This has been corroborated by people within the automotive industry. They're saying that by 2025, every new vehicle that comes off the manufacturing lines is going to be an electric vehicle. This is the auto industry saying this. By 2030, every new vehicle coming off the lines is going to be completely automatic, completely automated capacity to be driverless. That's not very far away anymore. What this means, and, and this, they are predicting, Tony is predicting mass adoption of electric vehicles um, and automatic vehicles, even to the point of mass abandonment of internal combustion engine vehicles that people already own for a very simple economic reason. The cost of operating an electric vehicle electric automatic vehicle is, go is predicted to be in the neighborhood of about six to nine cents per mile as compared with 50 plus cents per mile for an internal combustion engine. So what does that have to do with agriculture? It has a lot to do with agriculture in fact because I I'm using the electric vehicles as, as an example of how rapidly this shift could happen to come about and that holds true also for a lot of industrial jobs. So the prediction is that um, as, as these robots and electric vehicles and, and different things are deployed in industry, we will be looking at approximately 40% unemployment and perhaps as early as 15 to 18 years from now, perhaps sooner. Uh, in fact, there are some people who, can, who are suggesting that it could happen in a, as quickly as 10 years. And I, I'm using the word unemployment, that is, employment as we understand it today and the jobs that we have and that we think about today. I believe there's tremendous resilience in the human spirit and that we always tend to come up with new things, but that will still be a very radical shift. So <clears throat> there'll be tremendous um, unemployment and one of the other things that it will mean for agriculture is that growing using land to grow crops for fuel no longer is economically viable. For that matter, it's not economically viable now. But that is an, that's a political process. And it's, from, from my perspective, it's not a question of if subsidies for ethanol and, and other biofuels are removed, it's only a question of when. Because the red ink is going to mount on them incredibly quickly. The, so, you look at this entire picture and you think about, okay, what happens when you have a fleet of robots and robotic vehicles that are doing a, a majority of the work and you have 40% unemployment? Um, there is general consensus between many leading thinkers who are thinking about these challenges that there will be the implementation of a universal basic income at some point. Um, and again, some are suggesting that it could happen as early as 10 years from now. Uh, I personally suspect it'll be a bit longer from that, about 15 to 18 years from now, uh, perhaps longer. It's, again, it's a political process, it's hard to know. There could be a lot of uh, social upheaval in that process, but it's likely that it will happen at some point. Now, you look at all of these different f engines, these different drivers of change, and you ask the question, how could this impact agriculture in the future? Well, what is the number one 
Actually, before I go there, I'd like to speak a little bit about what happens when you implement a universal basic income. If you, uh, again, if you want to explore these different ideas that I'm talking about, universal basic income and others, a bit more deeply, there's a very powerful book that is uh, titled Utopia for, I Utopia for Realists that uh, describes some of the research that has been done with universal basic income and uh, some other concepts that they're expecting to develop in the near future. Um, very, very insightful and very grounded book, although it will probably shake your perceptions of reality pretty deeply. Um, one of the occurrences with the development where, where universal basic income has been tested, the, the, one of the common critiques is that productivity is going to go down, people will not be inspired to go to work, they will have no desire to go to work, and uh, people will become lazy and do nothing and just live off the system. And in areas where it has been tested, that hypothesis has been completely invalidated. In fact, the opposite is true. Because what happens is when people have access to universal basic income, they, have, they now have the resource and the capacity to support their family. They no longer feel that they are, um, they are stuck in a job that they passionately dislike or that they don't enjoy doing. And so instead, they quit doing the things that they don't enjoy and they start focusing on things that they are passionate about. And in one example cited in the book, um, there's a village in uh, Canada, S was, work was done 15 years ago. Uh, and I, right now the name of the town is escaping my mind. Um, but they described how innovation in this small area tremendously increased. New patents, new ideas, new discoveries in this small area increased tremendously because people were able to pursue their passions. They were able to pursue the things that they were really excited about. Now, when you look at that context, What's the number one hobby in the world and in the US? Gardening. People have a tremendous inherent desire to have a connection with life and living processes. They want to spend time outdoors, spend time connecting with plants, and, and um, increasingly, people want to grow their own food. So, yes? Is it okay to ask a question? Of course. It's okay to challenge me. I don't. Uh, I have lots of opinions, and not a lot of substantiation. Second question. Out of all the factors you just listed, I, I don't think you mentioned um, like any social growing preference for both the growth. That's a very good point. I did not mention any consumer desires or consumer demand in the way consumer demand might change behavior of the current existing system over the, uh, over the short and medium term. Um, and there's a reason for that. I have a somewhat controversial belief that uh, consumer demand has, v has a much smaller impact on driving change in the food supply than we would like to imagine that it does. I'm not suggesting that it has no impact because it does. It does have an impact. Obviously General Mills now has GMO, Cheerio GMO free Cheerios. And uh, um, Danone and other major manufacturers have a, are expressing a very strong desire in developing a regenerative agriculture label and standard that they're able to um, identify their products with. So there is a growing desire by large food corporations to identify themselves with a healthier food standard. If we look at the shifts and the changes that has happened um, in, the, in the food industry, um, and the way that uh, Pepsi is a great example, the way that PepsiCo has divested themselves of, of high sugar content, high salt content snacks and has begun investing in acquiring brands that are much healthier. Uh, there, there is movement happening in the food industry. But I think, so there, there are two kind of two different levels. There is the manufactured food industry, uh, snack foods, etc. And then there is actual fresh produce, fresh fruit and vegetable production, as well as grains, rice, etc. And farmers, large-scale farmers, the 7,000 growers who produce fruits and vegetables for the majority of the fruits and vegetables for the country, are generally, this is a generalization, but they are generally very resistant to being told what to do by consumers. In fact, they have an intense intensely negative emotional response. About um, three or four years ago, successful farming 
It was a monthly magazine publication. They published a magazine on the front cover was Meet Your New Boss. Millennials are driving changes in the food revolution. <coughs> and I spoke at a conference two days after that uh, publication hit the magazine racks and farmers were incensed. They were intensely ticked off by the public, by the fact that people who knew nothing about farming were going to tell them what they could and couldn't do. What really drives farmers to change is economics. If you can describe for growers how they can be more successful and make more money using regenerative farming systems than what they are currently using, they will change as fast as they can implement. Secondly, uh, with, with all that, farmers are a really interesting group of people, which I'm sure you know, but in, this, in this, um, this particular audience, this particular group of farmers, it's really intriguing. They, they do not desire, they, they don't want to be told what to do by people who don't understand farming. And at the same time, there is a deep level and an inherent level of and a desire to not apply toxins. We, we have this idea, I know that many consumers have the idea that uh, many of the large scale producers just apply toxins willy nilly on, an, on just to, to, as a band aid to cover all problems. And that is not true. Um, the, the leading growers, not just the leading growers, but the majority, vast majority of fruit and vegetable growers are extremely conscientious about applying pesticides and they're constantly trying to find ways to reduce them S to such a degree that the, the communication that we've had with growers over the years, we, we are now. And this has shifted, it, this has been ongoing for a while, but there is a growing awareness and a growing discomfort among large scale farmers about continued pesticide applications to the point where we can have a conversation with growers now about, about um, using nutrition to grow disease and insect resistant crops and they immediately want to hear more. Uh, even 10 years ago, there was, ah, that sounds like an interesting idea, but I'm not sure I actually need that on my farm. Today, they want it. They desire it on their operation. Um, and so that is, I suspect that desire and need is and the desire to shift away from using chemicals on their operations is not because of consumer demand, but it's because of a growing awareness and realization of what these compounds are actually doing to themselves, their families, their employees. They care more about that than they do about consumer demand, in my perception. So. When we look at all these different engines and all these different drivers and we bring all of them together and we try to imagine what a future might look like, um, one, one more piece worth adding. Um, I mentioned that biofuels are likely to disappear, particularly corn and, and soy-based biofuels. 40% um, of current corn production goes for ethanol in the U.S. Um, and there's, there's a, a lot of, again, it's a big, there's, there's a large story about what is happening with corn and soybean production in the U.S., but um, China has closed the window on soybean production, or on U.S. soybean imports, and there is a growing realization among people in the industry, in the, in the ag, ag business industry, that the tremendous volume of soybean imports to China might have been an opportunity that existed in a window of time and that opportunity might never ever return. Because China is at a point now where they, if they chose to be, they can be almost completely independent of U.S. soybean imports <coughs> because they can import from Brazil and from Africa and they no longer need U.S. soybeans. So there could be the potential for a substantial drop in demand in soybeans and now you have 40% elimination of corn acres being going, grown for ethanol, and all of a sudden you have a tremendous amount of land in the Midwest um, that there is no longer a need to grow commodity crops for. And now it's, it's a question of, uh, there's a question in my mind of how rapidly will fruit and vegetable production move to the Midwest? Um, how rapidly will those acres be converted to growing actual food crops such as um, buckwheat and milo and rice and crops other than corn and soybeans because there's there's a tremendous amount of food production that can happen in the Midwest that isn't currently happening. In 19, prior to 1946, Iowa was sixth in the nation for apple production and there was a very heavy freeze in 1946 that destroyed many of the apple trees that were present 
and they were never replanted because corn was very profitable. So today, any crop that is not corn and soybeans is considered a specialty crop in Iowa. Alfalfa hay is considered a specialty crop in Iowa. When I look at all these different drivers and factors, I see two distinct possibilities, and they're not, they're not necessarily mutually exclusive. They may be very complementary. The first is that uh, as robotics are developed in the near term, they will intensely favor large-scale producers, people who can justify and afford a quarter to a half a million dollar machine to do, the, to do harvesting for them. Those large-scale operations will have a very strong economic competitive advantage initially. Over time, as robots become more inexpensive, they will also become available to smaller scale producers. On the other hand, once that we have the deployment of a fleet of electric automatic vehicles, plus the, uh, plus the addition of a universal basic income, I believe that has the potential to unleash a food revolution the likes of which we almost can't imagine. Imagine, so if you're familiar, all of you are familiar with Uber, and Uber's, one of more recent, more recent divisions is Uber Eats, ordering food from a restaurant. Imagine Uber Food, being able to order food from a local farmer that you don't have to go pick up and the farmer doesn't have to go deliver. That the, farmer can, that the consumer can place an order for fruits and vegetables online, and the farmer can pack it, and put it into an automatic vehicle that delivers it. That's going to become reality. It's not a question of if, it's only a question of when and who will be the first to do it. So now that provides the, the commercial framework, the commerce framework for a completely decentralized, localized and regionalized food supply. And you combine that with universal basic income, we know that there are many young people who have a strong desire to be in farming and to grow food, but they are limited because of a lack of access to resources, lack of access to capital and to land. And these young farmers have already d demonstrated tremendous resilience and uh, very innovative ways of, of getting access to land if they are in a position, I believe that if they're in a position where they are no longer dependent on having to produce an income and they'll have, they have backup support in the form of universal basic income, I suspect it's very possible, probable even, that many young people will have, and not just so, not young people, but other people, uh, people across the entire age spectrum, will begin producing food for sale into a local network. So there is, these, these are two, two very distinct possible realities. One is where we could have very rapid proliferation of a localized and regionalized food supply. And on the other hand, where we could have very intense uh, economic competition from very large-scale corporations and very large-scale growers because of access to robotics. So these are, these are two very distinct possibilities, very strong polarities, but they are not mutually exclusive. I think both are possibility, and I think they could both partner very well. So um, agriculture in the future, I think those are the big picture pieces that I think about, and uh, yeah, I'd love to hear your thoughts and ideas. And the resource to make the batteries. Um, first of all, I'm the wrong guy to ask that question. Um, I think Tony Seba would be able to answer those questions well. You've identified two key, particularly battery resources, I think are uh, major constraints. But with that being said, I'd like to offer two thoughts. Actually, let me answer your question on energy first. Um, it requires less energy in the form of of an electric vehicle than it does to run an internal combustion engine. So at the very, the very simplest and the most basic argument is that even if we were to burn fossil fuels to produce that energy, it would still be much more energy efficient to run an electric vehicle and we would use less fossil fuels than we are using today. That's, that's the very most basic, but there's all kinds of permutations above and beyond that, of course. In regards to the resources to make batteries, um, I believe very strongly that humans, people are innovative enough that we're going to figure it out, that we will no longer be dependent on batteries which are limited resource reliant. And my reason for saying that is when we look at history, 
there have been so many points in history when people said that um, we're going to use all of the Earth's resources if we keep doing what we're doing. A, a great example um, was with uh, communications and copper wire. So copper wire was being used to transport electricity and to transport um, and for a lot of phone lines, etc. And there was an article published, several a series of articles actually, I forget the exact timeline or the exact date period right now, but um, the idea that was expressed was that um, we're going to deplete the entire known world reserves of copper to produce lines for communication networks and communication networks are unsustainable. We're not going to be able to keep using them as we are. Lo and behold, the development of cell phones and satellites, which require just a fraction of the amount of metal, uh, completely displaced that system. There, is, there, are, there are a number of research institutes right now who are actively working on developing battery technology that is not lithium dependent. They're suggesting that it's maybe three to five years away from commercial deployment, and then we will no longer be using lithium ion batteries to charge cars or to uh, power cars or any other electric vehicles. Yes? One side note to what you're saying the old idea of that you have to charge something that's electric. I drive a car that requires, is a, runs oftentimes on electricity that does not require plugging in at all. It recharges from the braking system within the car itself from the gas engine, and it is so efficient. And it's a stepping stone to such highly efficient energy vehicles that it's, it's the idea is going to be mind blowing within a few years. They already have these kinds of models. And I mean, even if you follow just the EV1 and who killed the electric car, we had incredibly efficient vehicles 20, 30 years ago that were killed because they did not support the old oil paradigm. But my question is actually about the land. And do you see the possibility of a second dust bowl situation happening as these massive cornfields are um, evacuated and we have um, depleted uh, microbiome in the atmosphere and in the land and we have glyphosate raining down, keeping that <laughs> from happening? And, and if you do, I don't the actually. Side of the swing of nature as she comes to balance, right? <clears throat> um, what sort of swings do you see on a mass? Are you asking, I'm not quite sure I understand your last question, what kind of swings in what context, in what framework? Right, so as, as Mother Nature heals these large swaths of land that have been abandoned in the Midwest but prior to farm situations setting up, unless you think the economics of it's going to be a swift move from California to the Midwest, <clears throat> which I can't envision, it's, what do you see Mother Nature doing? I mean, do you see... I see, uh, if, to answer your question very simply, I would say I see mankind still heavily influencing and regulating whatever Mother Nature would desire to do. So I don't, it's, it's a very nuanced conversation obviously, but I do not see an abandonment of acres happening anywhere. Obviously farmers are incredibly invested in their land and they will have a strong desire to keep farming that land. So what will happen is that crops will shift, but acres will continue to be farmed. Now imagine, if, if you do the math, um, right now, today, and this has been true for the last, um, I think seven out of the last 10 years, it is more economically viable and more profitable, I'm, I'm gonna say it's more profitable to grow 100% grass-fed beef than it is to grow corn on most acres in the Midwest. Most farmers are not doing that because A, they're, they're afraid, they don't know how, they've not learned that, and they're deeply invested. They have tremendous capital investments in and commitments in crane machinery and equipment, tractors, steel, et cetera, et cetera. And they're so, subsidized. And they're what? And they're subsidized. And they're subsidized. Well, yes, but even with the subsidies, it is more profitable to grow grass-fed beef than it is to grow corn. That's been true for seven out of the last 10 years. And so what will happen at some point invariably is more and more farmers will realize that I mean, farmers have, been, have lost money growing corn on every acre that they planted for the last two years, but they were locked in, they, they feel that they are trapped. They're stuck in the system because of the, the deadly trio of banks that they have loans from and the insurance, uh, crop insurance industry and subsidies. So they feel that they're stuck. They have to keep doing what they're doing. Ultimately, uh, farmers individually, not collectively, but individually, farmers are realizing that they have to break out of the system. And 
So I see, and I'm, we're already observing this, on the fringes, on the edges. So for example, we're starting to do a lot of work in southwest Kansas, where farmers are irrigating with water out of the Ogallala Aquifer, which they shouldn't be doing, and they know they shouldn't be doing it, and they have a desire to reduce it. So farmers, not regulators, but farmers are actively, uh, are actually getting together collectively and saying, okay, we have to reduce our water consumption by this amount over this many years, because in 10 years from now, we're not gonna have water anymore. And so they're saying, okay, you are going to eliminate this many wells, you're going to eliminate this many wells, and we're going to start growing crops that are not dependent on irrigation. So Kansas is starting to produce a lot more milo and a lot more sorghum and a lot less wheat and corn and soybeans that are dependent on irrigation. So farmers are incredibly resilient. They're very committed to the land that they're farming. And um, the, if we can continue to communicate our message that re these regenerative farming systems are not only more profitable and more successful, that they're better for the environment, better for soil health, et cetera, um, th this, is, this is not just a message from, from us at Advancing Eco Agriculture, but a message that is being communicated by many people and by many organizations. And there is a groundswell happening in, in um, five years ago, if I would have given a presentation to mainstream farmers in Iowa talking about regenerative agriculture, I probably would have been, would have been tired and feathered and run out of town. Today, they have a strong desire to hear that message and hear that, hear that information. There's been a complete shift, and I expect that shift is going to be uh, is already being transferred from thinking into action. So I actually, uh, I'm very inspired and I'm very hopeful by what I see happening in agriculture. And I think that agriculture in the very near future is going to be much better for the planet and it's going to be much better for the people who consume that food. Yes? Um, so my question is, I've heard that as the, in the rise in interest in like CBD and hemp has gone up, the farms across the country have been bought out by Monsanto and other chemical companies that to the tune of like million dollar buyouts of these farmers. And assuming if I were that farmer and I had all the debt and kids to pay for, et cetera, I would probably take the deal. How are we, how do you envision the corporate interest saying, oh, I like what John's saying. I want to get in on this. Let's stop producing glyphosate and start, you know, whatever. Awesome, go for it. But then they're buying up the, the farmland to then commodify it and then turn, like have, you know, is it okay to have commodity agriculture if it's regenerative or is, what's the difference between a regenerative commodity agricultural future and a small farm local food shed future? Can they exist together or are they gonna look they, like it is they, today? They exist, to, they exist together now in this moment. I think they will continue to coexist in the future and uh, regenerative ecosystems are not dependent on scale. In fact, and this may not be a popular opinion in this room, but regenerative ecosystems are actually, you can regenerate them faster, more successfully on a large scale than you can on a small one. So you're saying, which I'm totally cool with, I'm not like being targeted, but are you saying that the future of regenerative agriculture is going to regenerate the earth faster if it's done on a large scale than it Absolutely. Can be Absolutely. It's, it's, you, you get, you get collective energy, the more, the more acres that are engaged, you begin having climactic impacts and environmental impacts, and you can do that much more successfully on a large scale than you can on a small scale. But is and that then the business running the farm? Like, is that really the farmer running the farm? Is that even possible? Like, do you have that large scale business expertise of the farmer to be able to do it on So, um, this, is a, this is an interesting conversation. And I have a lot of thoughts, more than I have time to share. But um, what, I, what I would say very simply is that um, today, what is driving the change is farmers. And in the near future, what is and will be driving the change will actually be the large businesses. Business, I don't see businesses as being a negative. Businesses are what drive change. Businesses are the engine that drives change. And this, is, um, this has been an interesting conversation. It's, it's too much to get into right now. but. You don't drive change by sharing information. At Advancing Eco-Agriculture, we are not successful simply by sharing our story and telling people about what they could do. We have not successfully implemented change until we have inspired, the, the, the phrase that I use is inspiration to the point of action. You actually have to act. You have to make a decision. You have to do something differently. And businesses are the ones that drive those change. And we have to remember that a farm is a business. Every single farm is a business. So 
I don't see businesses, even large agribusinesses, as being inherently negative. Now, with that being said, um, the business models that are being used by large agribusinesses are being disrupted intensely, very rapidly every day. And I do not expect that they will exist in the future the way they do today. Uh, what that will look like, I don't know exactly, but it will be a very different business environment in 20 years from now than what it is right now. Yes? What about a player like Amazon, which is in the delivery uh, system service, um, and <coughs> See, Amazon doesn't actually negotiate down costs of the products that it sells. You can, pr you can, you can put a product on Amazon for sale at any price. Mm -hmm. but yeah, but they discount it. You have no control over their discount. We know this from publishing. You have no control. They get to decide. It's been this huge shakeup in the publishing world where there's, you have no control. You could be listing a book at $30, and <coughs> Amazon could discount it 58%, 60% one day, 70% the next day. There's an algorithm. Nobody knows what it is. Sorry. But in order to have that level of control, you have to have control over the entire ecosystem, which Amazon has with book sales. And it is, I would suggest, extremely improbable and unlikely. Well, I shouldn't say that. But Whole Foods. But Whole Foods is less than a fraction, they're a fraction of a percent of the entire, full, of the entire food supply chain. They are, uh, if you look at the, the entire US food supply chain, Whole Foods doesn't even register as a blip on the screen because they are so small. To us, they're years? important. What about if they're like, they buy Coke next, and they buy Nestle, then they buy, you know, whatever? It's an, I think the know. question is interesting because to me it's monopolization. That's a question. It's like, where does monopolization end? Does that ever end? Does the self-interest of a corporation ever really end, even in a utopic scenario, if we still are within this current political and economic system? Um, there are other interests that Monsanto and Amazon have too, and they're political, right? Like to be able to lobby and pay off politics. So I may be more skeptical in that sense, and I'd like to hear what you think of that, because I think you sound super optimistic, and <laughs> I would love to feel that optimism, but there's a part of me that's like, oh, I don't know about that self-interest and monopolization question. I'm sorry to interrupt you. The question, the question that I would ask of you, for all of you to think about, I don't have all the answers. I don't have the answers. I don't. I have a lot of questions as well. But um, one of my mentors, a guy who I tremendously respect, um, Charlie Munger, said that you are only qualified to have an opinion about something when you can articulate the opposing perspective better than the opposition. And so the question that I would ask of you is you, you see all the negatives and the challenges with large-scale corporations and the impact that they might have in the future. And I would ask you the question of what is, what is the opposing viewpoint? And what's the energy that is behind the opposing viewpoint of that? Um, because I don't have the answer to the questions that you asked. Now, I would suggest that when you have the framework for a decentralized, regionalized distribution system, and Uber food, or whatever the context of the case might be, you now have, and with the development of blockchain technology, you now have the capacity for a direct transaction from farmer to consumer, no intermediary. You eliminate the need for Amazon, Whole Foods, a grocery store, a restaurant. You can now have a direct farmer to consumer link that can be easily facilitated, and the logistics can be easily facilitated. Right now, this is a challenge for farmers, and the challenge to connect consumers and farmers is a logistical challenge. It is also a technology challenge, but it's primarily a logistical challenge because farmers <coughs> don't, um, if they're running, many farmers enjoy farming and growing plants while they don't have the bandwidth, the resources, and the desire <coughs> to attend a farmer's market two or three times a week. It consumes too much of their energy. And all of a sudden, when there can be pickup on the farm, it completely changes that entire equation. And you now have a very close connection to the consumer and to the farmer that doesn't require a lot of the farmer's energy. So I would suggest that there is a possibility, in fact, that Amazon and large-scale corporations are not even a part of the supply chain anymore for an increasingly greater proportion of the food supply. <coughs> there is that possibility. Yes? Um, a lot of technologists talk about the future of food is like hydroponics or urban vertical gardening. <coughs> 
I would challenge them to grow 90% of the crops that are grown for food production in an indoor farming or vertical farm. You can grow salad greens, tomatoes, cucumbers, and peppers, and that's it. And who wants a diet composed of salad greens, tomatoes, and peppers, and cucumbers? I mean, there's, there's nut production, fruit production, uh, root crops. I mean, the list of this goes on and on and on. In, indoor vertical farming is um, it's an intriguing idea. I think it's a useful and important idea. I think we can learn a lot about managing plants in that context, but there's a whole lot more to the story. And, um, and also, something that I find a bit uh, perturbing personally is the, the intellectual dishonesty that is used in promoting these systems. They, uh, there will be uh, claims such as uh, we'll have this one building that will displace um, 27 acres of outdoor field production, of, of lettuce production in California. Well, that's true in the sense that they only count one cutting. And these fields in California are harvested every four to six weeks, boom, 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 boom. And when you take that over an entire year, that one acre field in California is in fact incredibly more efficient and more productive than the indoor farming operation. So uh, as it exists currently, I don't see it as a viable long-term strategy for most crops. Yes, I'll come to you in a moment. So the question is, what is the role of biotechnology in the future of regenerative agriculture? And I'm assuming you're asking uh, specifically the context of genetic modification, et cetera? No. No? No. How do you define biotechnology? Well, I mean, more just, um, I guess I'm asking a broader question. You're using it for breeding, you know, not just for changing genetics, but understanding the genetics. Um, there is, so, so my perspective on a biotechnology, um, which is, I would define it as uh, genetic engineering, CRISPR, gene editing, et cetera, et cetera, um, and related and associated technologies. There are, again, there's a, a growing polarity between the two, um, the two camps at opposite ends of the spectrum. There are the large corporations which, we, which we've been talking about which have a desire for patented technologies and they're continuing to develop and, and now have, um, of, uh, have uh, gene edited and genetically modified organisms and microbial inoculants. And on the other hand, there is a rapid, extremely rapidly growing group of, of companies and science in this area of regenerative agriculture of completely displacing the current status quo. We're not, and I think this is a very important perspective, we are not fighting against Monsanto. This is not an anti-Monsanto conversation. This is not anti-Bayer Cargill ADM. We are not seeking to fight against what currently exists. We are seeking to completely displace what currently exists by creating something that is infinitely better. A, a, <laughs> a, as, as Einstein said and is often quoted, uh, you cannot solve an existing problem at the current level of thinking. You have to go to a new level of thinking. So let's not try to f compete with what we currently have. Let's replace it with something that is entirely new. And so when I look at the energy that is being expressed in these two different groups, um, the large-scale agricultural corporations have tremendous economic influence, but the people in regenerative, in the regenerative agriculture space, I would say match and exceed that with intellectual and brain influence and passion and desire. When we look at just what has happened just in the last five years, in the last five years, in the area of regenerative agriculture, there have been multiple proposals uh, developed for branding and labeling regenerative agriculture produced products. Uh, there have been the onboarding of literally thousands of farmers and ranchers. This is, this is particularly inspiring in a uh, particularly inspiring area in the area of um, beef production. And in the area of beef production and dryland farming, dryland farming throughout um, West Central Canada and uh, West Central United States, there has been a growth and development of regenerative agriculture to the point where it is, it will soon be, and soon as in the next two to three years, if it is not already in localized regions, will be the dominant. Regenerative agriculture will become and is becoming the mainstream in these areas that are stressed. And they are being driven to this by economic stress. Beef producers, uh, as, as a general group, beef producers have not made money in the last 80 years. And they have, this is obviously a very broad generalization, individual operations have done better. But um, they're seeing that there is economic potential in grass-fed beef production that is driving and motivating tremendous change. And secondly, um, in the areas that are drought stressed, where they have to deal with limited water supply, 
the economics of regenerative systems are clearly winning out and there is large scale conversion to doing multi cropping to doing cover cropping to growing integrated crops dual crops side by side so there are many things that are happening that agriculture is actually moving in a very positive direction on a scale of tens of thousands of acres i have a number of questions up here yes go ahead um, this question is about growing nutrient dense food yep My perception is that <clears throat> with the adoption of these regenerative farming systems, growing nutrient-dense food is really a function of soil biology. And as these farmers are developing regenerative farming systems, they are by default growing more nutrient-dense foods than they have in the past. That's what I'm actually observing happening. It's not, not necessarily an objective, but it's occurring by default. Yeah. Yes? I have about 10 questions. <laughs> <laughs> I'll keep my answers brief. Well, no, I, I'll only ask one. <laughs> It doesn't. <laughs> Next question. Is that why the university is seeing things that people being basically paid a basic income to keep going? What's the financial system that actually is behind that? Then? This gets to my question. <laughs> <laughs> Please go ahead. And I, um, well, I, you know, the way, the way I've been hearing you talk about regenerative agriculture is primarily as a, as a land based ecosystem regeneration. And I think some of, a lot of the conversations that I've been hearing and questions I've been hearing and, and kind of Michigan that I've been hearing in the room is, is gets, it gets to the question of is regenerative agriculture truly regenerative if it's only regenerating, regenerating the soil and the land and it's not regenerating human culture and yes. community. And, and, is there and, a word and, and your question gets yeah. right to the heart of that because the money system yes. is the heart of why we don't have a, a regenerative social, cultural, economic system, the way money is structured. And it, how can it be regenerative agriculture if it's not regenerating human society? Now, the universal basic income piece and some of the stuff you talked about there kind of starts heading that direction. But, you know, that's- I guess the uh, right question. Uh, <laughs> just, <laughs> hang, if you can hang on just one moment, I'd like to go to Elizabeth and then I'll come back to you. Thank yes. you. I'm loving this conversation. There are a lot of us working in the regenerative space. Yes, there's regenerative economics. Absolutely, we have to transform the debt-based money system. It all feeds into this view that we all have understanding system dynamics and not this linear rubbish that we've been taught forever. So when we remove ourselves from the basic scientific method of problem solution analysis and start to get into really what a regenerative culture and regenerative thinking and regenerative approaches to life happens and then we start to do this. So thank you for all that you're doing. And on this monetary piece, I was interested in your opening comments about um, blockchain and your, in your investment interest in some of those areas. But I'm bringing, looking at the monetary policy piece and the regenerative piece into new monetary systems. So what do you? We could have some intriguing conversations. <laughs> I think this entire conversation actually is the foundation for a lot of intriguing conversations. I wish we'd have more time, and I did look before we started, and now I forget again. What time are we supposed to end? 12.30? 12.30. We have 30 minutes. Um, <coughs> I'd love to comment a little bit, but I'll go to a few more people before I share my thoughts. Yes? Let me just say that <coughs> your comment about um, money being a big draw to farmers in terms of making a change. You know, we saw that when we helped Patagonia switch over to organic, and we saw it when we helped 
farmers in California switch over to growing organic cotton that they were interested as long as they were making money. They were like altruistic. They were like, uh, didn't want to wear Birkenstocks. You know, they really just wanted to make more money. Yep. And, and you can't, you know, be opposed to that. I mean, that has to be one of the drivers. You achieve but what you incentivize. Because we're in the capitalist system. I mean, yep. that's where we are right now. Yep. Yes, Elizabeth? Everybody's focusing on money, so let's keep them focused on that one place. Let's just change what the money is. Yeah, exactly. I like that. Go ahead. So my question was about relationships, because you said that what changes the farmer's behavior is going to be the economics, and then you also added their relationships. It's their uh, relationship to their family and how they're affected by the toxins applied in the landscape. Mm -hmm. And so I'm curious, what are the relationships on the other side? Because we know we're gonna we're gonna um, modify our expectation of consumer power and change. But what about consumer relationships? So if I want to organize my relationships so that I am benefit, I am benefiting this regenerative economy, then what do those relationships look like? How is blockchain relevant to that? And is this all just a restructuring of distribution? Yikes. <laughs> <laughs> yes. I can ask a question, Don, when you're ready, when you, when you need a break from answering that one. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> I'm, I'm, I'm there for you. <laughs> All right. Um, I scarcely know where to begin. So, I find the entire monetary policy and the money conversation, thank you. Um, I think that is an important foundational conversation. Um, I'm very intrigued by the dynamics of the economy as they currently exist. And um, if you want to dig deeper and learn more, there are um, two, two resources that I would extremely highly recommend in this area. One of them is titled uh, The Princess of the Yen by Richard Werner, who is one of the leading economics professors in my estimation in the world today. And again, sorry. the Princess of the Yen, Richard Werner. And in this book, he describes how, he, the summary, very simply, is he describes how economies actually work rather than the way people think they work. Uh, and theorize that they work. And it's, it's a very, if, you're, if you have any interest in this type of topic, you will not put the book down until you finish reading it. Um, and the second is a YouTube clip um, by Ray, Ray Dalio on uh, principle, I forget how it's titled, the principles of economics or how the economy actually works. And uh, I think both of those will give you some intriguing in insights into some very important insights into our current monetary system. And not just into our current monetary system, but also um, what the real world alternatives actually are and should be. Um, Ray Dalio, D-A-L-I-O, Bridgewater Associates. Yes? I'm just curious, you talked a little bit about beef production, but I'm curious what you think about the future of protein in general and when you think people are going to give up this um, fantasy about lab beef. Okay. We'll, we'll come back to that. I want to, yes, it's a good question. We'll come back to that, but let's, let's I want to finish up on uh, Elizabeth's question on blockchain. Um, so, I believe that blockchain technology can provide the framework for us to shift the monetary system away from a fiat currency, a fiat currency, to an actual money system. I think that the, the, the technology framework exists if we chose to use it. And the, I suspect that there's arguments on, on both, pros and cons on both sides of this argument. But I suspect that blockchain is likely to become a major, perhaps the major, means of financial transactions in the future on the consumer level 
a small scale level. Perhaps with government support or perhaps in spite of the government. And so we're seeing this phenomena somewhat taking place with blockchain already. Um, the state of Ohio is now accepting blockchain for tax payments. So I think one of the, the uh, first is, yeah. Accepting blockchain payment, or excuse me, accepting Bitcoin for tax payments. So will that trend continue? Will that continue with other states, et cetera? I think there's a strong potential that the framework is there. It's only a question of how will it be, continue to be implemented and deployed? Yes. Thank you. Um, all right, there, there's, this is a huge topic, and honestly, it's a topic that I, I've read a lot about and I'm intrigued about, but it's not really a topic that I'm qualified to have an opinion about because I can't articulate the opposing viewpoint. Um, so I, I'd like to move on to some of the other questions. Uh, you asked a question about lab-based meats, and um, lab meats, <coughs> excuse me, I, uh, I attempted to, to do a very detailed economic and ecological and environmental analysis, footprint analysis of laboratory grown meats versus grass fed meat versus corn fed meat. And um, I got about 30, 40% of the way into that project and then I decided that I wanted to get married. So I got married two weeks ago. Uh, thank you. <laughs> um, so that is currently unfinished, but um, the, the, oh, I'm sorry? Which? <laughs> Not the marriage. <laughs> um, so my, it, it has already become clear, even though the assessment is not complete, it's already become clear that um, from, a, again, purely from an economics perspective, grass-fed beef at this moment is a very strong winner, also from an ecological and environmental perspective. And it was very difficult for me to find information and to get the information that I needed about the actual components and constituents that are produced in growing lab, lab meat. It's a very secretive process, but I was able to identify that it is largely coming from wheat and soy. And I should say specifically wheat and soy and components of wheat and soy being digested with genetically modified bacteria, which is an interesting conversation in and of itself. So, um, with that, it is possible that the economics of lab-based meat might be competitive to grass-fed beef, but the ecological and environmental costs will be orders of magnitude higher. So. <laughs> Amongst the 50 other projects that I have going, yes. Awesome. So, point is, so thank you. Um, I want to go a little further with that, and I want to. I'm getting around to ethics. Um, most of my clients are, a lot of my clients are cities and towns. I can name 20 right now across New England. I have one corporate client that's a certified B corporation. I, I 
I probably have more, but I'm thinking of King Arthur Flower as a brilliant certified B company that wants to stand for something. They don't work with grants. So I'm drawing a distinction there between <coughs> cities and towns that represent their people, a voice theoretically that represent what their people's have demand, <coughs> versus corporations which are fairly short term and driven by dollars. Um, so immediate return. Um, I submit that you mentioned pesticides as well. Yes, I agree. People are farmers, growers, the general population. We want to see a reduction in toxins. I agree with that. However, we're also like crazy concerned about appearances and <laughs> we just don't get it sometimes on our health. So two, two points. You won't ever get bit by a mosquito at Middlebury College graduation. It's in mosquito country. They're, they'll hold you down and bleed you, but you will not encounter mosquitoes in May in central Vermont at Middlebury College. You should ask why. Bennington, Vermont is also a place where ornamental pesticides are applied. That's the county that just blows away the rest of the state. Because we're all about appearances. So my question is really about, are, we know the pace of climate change is, is ramping up. I've seen incredible, it's been a good year for the vine species, like the last three years, poison ivy, or you have a bittersweet game on Native versus non-native, doesn't matter. So the pace is just going, is ramping up. Do we have time to put our willingness to learn and figure out what's going on ahead of our immediate ethic, which says just just get it done and just make it look good? What are, just what are your thoughts on that? I'm sorry if that's too bad. Can you can you rephrase your question a little bit? Do we? Sure. <coughs> sure. I, I guess I'm, I'm I'm saying that consumers drive certain decisions. We also have our ethics get confused by immediate versus. Oh, long gotcha. Term. And are we, do you see us being able to keep pace with the pace of change? Abandoned ag space, you only get a year or two of, the, of, the, of abandoned ag land before it's absolutely overrun by pigweed, gerbil, parsnip, bittersweet, you name it. So there's just no room for error anymore in managing landscapes. Mm -hmm. My read in the last 50 years. Yeah. Um. That's an interesting and, and a very, it's actually, no, it's a, it's a good question. It's a question that I'm not sure I'm qualified to answer, but I think it's a very important question to ask and think about because the majority of chemicals are no longer used in agriculture. They're used in landscaping and turf and for home and garden use. That's, that's my, that was one of my points. And as crazy as this sounds, we're on the threshing, threshold of where the majority of fertilizers will no longer be used in agriculture which is even crazier. Um, and in many urban and suburban areas, actually the majority of water pollution is not coming from agriculture upstream, it's coming from lawns and gardens, from intense fertilizer applications. And I, I, have, I have many friends who visit from all over the world and um, from Europe, Australia, et cetera, and they, they come to the US and they're just freaked out about our lawn care industry. Yeah. It's obscene. It is. Um, so, <laughs> so um, how how will that shift and change? I mean, obviously, uh, I think that is something that needs to change. Uh, it, it does need to change, and in order for it to change, there is going to some degree need to be the need for changing social expectations of what a good home, what a good um, homemaker and uh, what, a, what a healthy household actually looks like and the way that it behaves. Um, just into what you said about mm -hmm. how the majority of the pesticides and the fertilizers are being used on lawns and, are, and I assume that that's partly if not totally due to marketing of to find a home for those products just like those chemicals and fertilizers came from you know, World War II and weapon making and then that was the rise of the industry because they needed to find a home for all this expensive shit that they no longer had a use for. So my question is, assuming that everything goes regenerative and assuming that everyone wants to make money and assuming that no one wants to throw money down the toilet. That's a lot of assumptions. How, well, okay, so. <laughs> well, Wait, please continue, yeah. I can't argue yeah. with them, Please continue. Um, <laughs> is, how, what is the role, I'm actually really not that interested marketing but now I'm feeling like marketing is like the most important thing because it's like what is the role of
of marketing those pr chemicals, those products to the people who might not know any better. So they might not be a farmer who has seen all the people in their family get cancer. They might be the people who are like, oh, I just moved to suburbia, whatever. How can we interface that and make those disappear? Like, is there a movement to disappear those things? Because <laughs> otherwise, someone's going to try to make money off them. You want to respond to that? Yeah. Um, I use Adam. Right now, uh, I'm presently operating, having designed a resource sharing program that's converting residential land in the form of lawns into <coughs> ed edible ecosystems based in permaculture fundamentals. So it's a type of regenerative in the sense that we use perennials. We, um, we, we, because it's based in permaculture fundamentals, we don't do things like there's no chemical applications. Everything that's grown on the land stays on the land. On Long Island, we have a, a tremendous amount of brush and mulch that's created from tree trimming and uh, what we call land scraping. Um, the combination of all those items on residential properties is actually transforming the way that the residents of Long Island relate to the land that they're presently occupying. So although we're only in our second year of our pilot program, the response has been tremendous. Homeowners, especially women who are in the health field, they have no interest in, in engaging with the food system as it's presently built. So by putting these edible ecosystems on residential properties, they can actually take control back into their homes, <coughs> the food that they're growing as well as the food that they're consuming. The benefit of this is because specifically in Suffolk County, we have roughly three quarters of an acre per, one, like a 1.5 million residents, three quarters of an acre per, there's actually enough land mass in Suffolk County to feed all of Long Island locally. So there is systems in place. Well when, that, I guess what I meant more was the chemicals are gonna have to go somewhere so if they're not going to go, like, because I, that's great, it's awesome. I'm just, that, that is I just one of the initiatives the to prevent the chemical use. Actually, uh, this, this, this isn't this, I, I think, it seems to me, when, when we look at, this, this is actually, this speaks to a point that you raised earlier. Large scale agrochemical corporations are not actively investing in developing new chemicals because the regulatory costs and the testing costs to get a new chemical approved are so high that it's very difficult to be profitable anymore. And so as a result, the, there has been a substantial shift in the research and development area away from pesticides to what they are categor categorizing as biocontrols and biostimulants. So biocontrols, and there, there's obviously, there's still a very narrow view of trying to identify a specific bacteria that can control another specific bacteria or can control a specific insect. Um, but the, the research and development investment that is being made in biocontrols and biostimulants is staggering and it is almost entirely being diverted from investment in agrochemicals. So they are making similar shifts to what the large scale food, uh, food ag, uh, and ag businesses are, or food businesses in shifting towards a more sustainable and regenerative model. So perhaps not with the exact same ideology that we might have, but they're, they are seeing that they need to develop different types of products that can be more appropriate and more useful on a larger scale. So that is, that is happening on a very rapid scale as well. Uh, biocontrol, those are umbrella terminology that uh, s s using the word biocontrol is the equivalent of saying, um, let's just say organic pesticide. So they are, there's hundreds of products, thousands of products and raw active ingredients that fit underneath of those categories that are actively being developed on a very large scale. So you were saying what the driving factors are with farming and they really don't revolve around consumers and so forth. The motivating factor within a municipal setting is liability. And so when we go for the liability issue, okay, so I work in the nonprofit sector, we advise on policy. And so um, if you're trying to make the argument that we killers are bad, you're gonna harm children and pets and the ecosphere and blah, 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 they don't care. What you need to say to them is, you're gonna get sued because you're negligent. And here's where you're defining your own insurance policies. And by the way, here's a ton of information you are now personally and professionally liable for. This is the most motivating factor amongst the the constituents that don't really buy into anything natural, you know, the chemical living is 
better living. But I'm seeing a total shift. In, and this is going across the country. There's networks of nonprofit people, mostly moms with sick kids, who we've empowered each other by the hundreds, if not thousands, going in at the municipal level at such a level that the industry has started pushing back by putting some legislation or some direction inside the farm bill saying, um, federal level, we need to regulate pesticide regulation because we don't want to see uh, these non-professionals trying to advise on policy and regulate pesticides. So there's another push to then get these activists through the organic land care programs or modified certification programs. So we're, <coughs> saying, we're not just moms, we're also certified to actually After, I think. This. I think your point is a very key one because um, after the verdict in California, exactly. a guilty verdict in California, Monsanto, there were 8,000 lawsuits filed against Monsanto for okay, glyphosate in, the, in, is it now 9,000, within the next couple of weeks. Yeah. So. know <clears throat> how the NAFTA that was just signed, which basically sets in, you know, non-national control by corporations of various regulatory policies, transnational, globally, <clears throat> <laughs> so, if you think this is so, a way to regulate it, you're wrong. This is a way to then unregulate it. Um, yep. Corporations drive the NAFTA. There are over hundreds of stakeholder corporations that basically write so I th I think, the prevailing law. Yeah. We're not quite up against the clock, but there seem to be a number of, of different conversations that are important that different people want to have and connect. So I'll take a couple of more questions, and then uh, I'd like to wrap up and we can have some individual group conversations over lunchtime. Yes? One thing, it's not a question, it's just uh, you need to be really careful about the data you use on pesticides because there's only two states in the United States, California and Vermont, that keep track of pesticide use reports that are actual use reports of farmers. All of the other data for pesticide use in the United States is kept by the United States Department of Agriculture and when we were doing the cotton project, we compared 20 years of data from California, which keeps track of pesticide use reports, with uh, USDA data for California. And the USDA data accounted for 53% of use. That means that USDA is saying we're only using half as many pesticides as we're actually using. Wow. So we have to be really careful about using USDA data if you're going to use data use California data or Vermont data. New York is trying to catch up, but most of the data in the country is USDA data. Yep. We had a question, uh, who am I going to pick? You, go ahead. Um, I'd be very curious to hear uh, your opinion of um, the notion coming out of the, uh, the uh, carbon sequestration idea that uh, we need to incentivize commodity farmers um, to, uh, to change the regenerative agriculture uh, by um, tying, by creating a carbon-based economy, um, particularly in the, um, in the high plains. You mentioned the Ogallal Aquifer, um, those farmers, that, that land, that soil is, um, yeah, it is mm -hmm. losing access to water, mm -hmm. uh, organic, soil organic matter is, is getting to the point where it can't support life in a lot of places. Do you see that as being an integral tool or don't worry about it? I see it as being a supportive or ancillary tool but not as an integral tool. I don't see it as a foundational driver. That's my perspective based on my exposure up to this point. I think that's also been the case in Australia where it has been present um, and there actually have been strong incentives for carbon sequestration for some time. Um, it, it has it's been a slight motivator, but it, I don't perceive it as being a major motivator at this point. And I might be mistaken about that, but that's my perception at the moment. Yes? I'm curious, uh, I mean, it sounds like there's a potential for incredible transformation uh, in the next couple of decades, but what's your sense in terms of a possible check or correction of the biomass of the human animal? <laughs> hmm. <laughs> well, and other planets. Let's not go there right now. Um, 
Fully 50% of the food that is grown in the world today is wasted before it's ever consumed. That isn't necessary at all, particularly as you develop the uh, decentralized and regionalized food economy. And the key point, again, is that the small, going back to the FAO data, um, small scale um, producers globally produce 70% of the total food supply with 30% of the resources. So we get into entire, uh, again, it's a, it's a very, uh, the question that you asked is a very involved question involving economic policy and um, monetary policy and a lot of different pieces that connect to it. But my, just looking at it purely from an agricultural food production perspective, we could use less land than we are using right now and produce and feed about 40 to 50 percent more people than we are feeding right now with less land than we're using at the moment if we simply changed our agricultural production systems. So we have the knowledge and the resources in the system to feed 12 to 13 billion people quite easily. <laughs> All right, I'll take one more question then I'm going to wrap it up. You've been asking for a while, yes. I was hoping you could just talk about where you think the future of the seed industry and seed breeding will go. Um, well, let me put it this way. In many of these conversations, seed breeding, um, development of biocontrols and biostimulants, uh, in, in many leading areas of research in the agribusiness, there is increasing polarity. And what I mean by that is large-scale corporations are investing heavily in one business model. And there has been a grassroots movement of an alternate model for 30 plus years. And that grassroots movement is at the point where it can no longer be called a grassroots movement. It is gaining an incredible amount of energy and steam. And um, that polarity will continue to, continue to grow, I believe. The disparity will continue to grow. There will be intense antagonism at some point. But um, it seems to me as if though on many, many of these different arenas, uh, seed production being one of them, uh, localized, regionalized, and um, very focused seed breeders will continue to displace the large scale producers. And, and I, I see this happening. We actually work with seed breeders and seed growers uh, right now, uh, actually next week at the Acres Conference, I'm uh, interviewing Ed Curry on the podcast. Uh, there will be a podcast live, so I, if you can, I really encourage you to tune into that. Ed Curry is um, the only that I know of and that Ed knows of um, open-pollinated chili pepper seed breeder in the world. So it's really interesting. He breeds open-pollinated plants, so anyone can grow their own, and his seeds are so good that he has a multiple offers to purchase them from large uh, vegetable seed companies. And they, they, they have made offers, but they're still hesitant, they're still resistant because they're not hybrids and they have no way of controlling them. And his varieties that he has developed are better than all the varieties that have been developed, that they have been able to develop. So I think that's, I'm using that as one example that uh, there is, we have the knowledge collectively, and many of us have the knowledge individually to be able to do our part to produce a system that is much better than the status quo. And I think that is continuing to happen and has actually more energy than the opposing system for a number of different reasons. This has been a very intriguing and entertaining discussion. Thank you all for your contributions, and uh, I hope you enjoyed it, and I hope you make some connections and continue those conversations from those that we had here today. Thank you for coming.